Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard, our only standard and source for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Now, I want you to use your imagination for a moment. I want you to imagine as you arose this morning and you went about your normal duties, preparing yourself for the day that you were about to enter into, you noticed a beautiful gift elegantly wrapped on the kitchen table. It had your name upon it. The wrapping is made of beautiful silver and gold and placed atop is a golden bowl and what is contained within this gift is ever-changing. Meaning that when you wake up each morning, you will find that same gift in the same place, but each and every time you open it, there will be something new and fresh that was not in there in the days before. Now, if you've seen through my illustration this morning, friends, you know that I am talking about the Word of God. And what I mean by that is every time that you read the Bible, every time you read a book of the Bible, no matter how many times that you have read it before, each and every time there is something new, fresh, and exciting that lies in wait for you if you would only read it. And I say this because I've talked to so many people who have mentioned that they've read the Bible as if one or two times is enough, and they fail to realize that the Bible is meant to be read every day, offering us new insight, revelation, and wisdom that if we do not continually read it, we're going to miss. Now, of course, one of the reasons that I mention this is because we are quickly approaching the first of the month. And that means hopefully you have just finished the New Testament, maybe for the first time in your life, and I don't want you to see that in the repetition of doing it all over again, that it will be boring or mundane. My hope is that you'll look forward to it with great anticipation with the new things you're going to learn that in the last time you missed, or that in the place where you are in your journey, You weren't ready for the new truth that will now be bestowed upon you because now you are ready being in a different place in your journey. And so I hope that you will join me on January 1st in reading the New Testament five chapters a day. And by the end of February, you will once again feel the accomplishment of having done so. Well, with that being said, We are continuing our story through the journey of the Bible, and today we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 17. Now, verse 1 begins by saying, Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99 years old, 24 years after he had his introduction to the Almighty. And it says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect, be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, flat, prostrate on the ground, and God talked with him. We hear so often, friends, those who speak of the Almighty, the powerful creator of all that is, And we hear them refer to him as the man upstairs. They say things like, he is my homie. He is my buddy. We even hear them sometimes profane his name and use it in ways that aren't even fit for a sailor. And no matter which way they use the name of God or how they identify God, it tells us a lot about their relationship with God. Because they don't approach him with reverence and fear in holiness, in awe, in wonder. But we are told here that Abram fell on his face. And friends, if he could have gone any lower, he would have. But he went to his lowest position before the Almighty. 
with such awe and wonder, fear and reverence. And the Lord began to speak with him and reconfirm the covenant that he was going to make with him, that he even had already made with him. And he says in verse 4, you will be a father of many nations, and your name no longer will be Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for you will be a father of many nations throughout the earth. Now, I am so glad that we have arrived at the point in the story where Abram's name is now being changed to Abraham, because as you've noticed in the past few videos, I've made the mistake of calling him Abraham before his name had actually been changed. But in the Hebrew, the significant part about Abraham's name is the H, because the H for us in the Hebrew represents the breath of God. And so just as God breathed into Adam and gave him life, gave him his spirit, this is an announcement to Abraham and all to know him hereafter that God now has a special anointing upon Abraham, that Abraham is in a new relationship with God, that Abraham is a different man with a different calling upon his life. And we see the same thing in verse 15 with Sarai. God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. There's the addition of that H again. The breath of God, the breath of life upon her life. This shall be her name. Well, God continues in verse 6 and he says, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of these, and kings shall come out of these. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now, friends, how long is everlasting? Is there an end to everlasting? I certainly hope not because we have been promised everlasting life in the person of Jesus. He says in verse 8, I will give unto you, Abraham, and to your seed after you the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, which is now possessed by the pagan nations, specifically the sons of Ham. And I will give you this land and make this covenant with you for an everlasting possession. And I will be the God of your children, of your offspring, of those to come after you. But notice again, it says everlasting. Now it's important to point this out because there is an idea that is moving through the people of God known as replacement theology. And what this simply means is that the church, the living body of Jesus Christ upon earth, since his death and resurrection, have now replaced all the covenants and all the promises of the people of God that were given to them in the Old Testament through Adam, through Abraham, through Moses and others. And friends, this is simply not true. If you look at Romans chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Has he rejected the covenant that he made with them? In common language, the question would be, has God changed his mind? Has God lied? Is the covenant not everlasting? And Paul says, God forbid. In verse 2, he says, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. In verse 8, he says he's given them a spirit of slumber. He hasn't rejected the promise. He hasn't changed the covenant. He's given them eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. And why has he done this? Because of verse 11. Through their fall, through the fall of the Jewish people, is coming to the Gentiles. Because the Jewish people have rejected the message and their Messiah, the way has been made open to the Gentile. And this has happened to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. He says in verse 29, the gift that I had given to the Jewish people is without repentance. And so it's important that we understand as we read in the book of Genesis that the covenant that God is making with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. You see, they are the first fruit. 
You could say that they are the vine and we are the branches off of the vine. That's what Paul indicates in Romans 11, verse 16. If the first fruit be holy, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, then the lump is also holy. And so we owe a great amount of gratitude unto the Jewish people because had not been for the Jewish people, Christianity would never have been born. Well, now that God has reestablished this covenant with Abraham, he says there's a way that you're going to mark yourself that is going to indicate this covenant between me and you. And so he says in verse 10, I want every man child among you to be circumcised. I want you to cut the foreskin of the man. In verse 12, he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of a stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with the money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, if you'll remember in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, when speaking about Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, it says, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of Mary's purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And so Mary and Joseph, being Jewish people themselves, being from the seed of Abraham, are following the customs of the Jewish people to the letter of the law. And so this should remind us again, as we've mentioned in times past, that Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. Jesus was a Jew, and he adhered to and followed Jewish custom. Well, the chapter is going to end with God blessing Isaac, the firstborn of Abraham and Sarah. He blesses Ishmael, the firstborn of Abram and Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. And then he promises Sarah in verse 21 that she is going to bear a child this time next year. And so now the promise isn't open-ended. They have a very specific time to look forward to for God to make his promise true. And so as God in verse 22 leaves off talking with Abraham and leaves Abraham's presence, Abraham takes Ishmael his son, all that were born in his house, all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said it unto him. Abraham didn't wait. He immediately took action upon what God had said. Now think back where Abram was when God first spoke. His trust and his faith and his obedience was weak in the Lord. But we can see through the progression of time how Abraham is becoming a man of God. It says in verse 24, Abraham was 90 years old and nine. 99 years old when he circumcised himself. His son Ishmael was 13 years old. And all the men of his house, these are grown men that were born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, they were all circumcised with him. Now, I was circumcised as a baby, so I have no recollection of how painful that experience was. And I've never met anyone that was circumcised in their older years. But there is a story in the book of Genesis that we're going to discuss here in the near future that speaks about the pain and agony of someone who is older receiving circumcision. Because as you're going to learn, these men, when they were circumcised, was in such pain and agony that when other men came in to defeat them, take their city, and kill them, they weren't even able to get up and defend themselves. And so we know because of this story that circumcision is a very painful event in a person's life. And most likely that's why it's done as we are children, or more precisely, infants. And so we end the chapter today seeing that Abram was obedient unto the Lord, even though it cost him great pain and suffering. 
And keep in mind, they didn't have the surgical tools that we have today. For all we know, they simply had flint and rock. And so we can only imagine how truly painful this was. But why was Abraham and all those who followed him so committed in their obedience unto the Lord? Because of the holy reverence, the fear, the awe, the wonder that they had in how they saw the Almighty. And I think that's what we're missing today, friends. We actually think and act as if disobedience is an option. And if we were only to eliminate those options from our minds, we would walk before God in a new light, in a new way. And we would live before God, our God, as Abraham lived before his God. And we would see in ourselves the same level of obedience, commitment, dedication, allegiance, honor, and service. But it must come and it must be based upon our view of God. So the question today is how do you see God? Do you see him with the same reverence and fear as Abraham did? Or is he simply your homie, an equal who steps down to your level rather than calling you up to his level? Oh, friend, as with Abraham, I pray that you and I will fall on our faces before God in reverence and awe and worship and love and adore him for the God that he is and offering us his hand of fellowship and reconciliation so that we can enjoy the blessing of all that he has to offer. Well, may he bless you today, friends. May your journey be full and bright. May you hunger and thirst after righteousness. And may your eyes be open so that you will see him in ways you never have before. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.